different from some quantum order or topological order where the orders are sort of characterized by not broken symmetry. At least we can characterize them and also work it out in a more straightforward fashion. So as I just written here, solid phase breaks the translational rotational. Symmetric phase, well, break one direction of translational symmetry along that way. Along this way, you can sort of see the still of translational symmetry. Rotational symmetry is also broken. Pneumatic is actually breaking the least symmetry, which is the rotational symmetry. And isotropic phase <coughs> recovers all of symmetry um, that you can think of. Possible examples for the pneumatic is that I would like these two as the most uh, significant one to be direction of control hall with the vehicle nine and a half and the strontium luginate. And I'm going to focus on this mostly today. And uh, you know, again, this motor insulator type TC was another candidate. Nick type is another candidate, but I'm not going to discuss that. But if I study, if I just am <coughs> interested in the pneumatic phase, then you can start thinking about this problem approaching instead from the crystal, which is a strong correlation problem, let's approach it from the bottom to the top. So I'm going to introduce or think about or study the pneumatic from the isotropy, which is a formulaic, and uh, consider pneumatic as a, some broken rotational symmetric phase, and use the weak coupling theory to describe this phase. So that, by saying that, um, first thing is that we have to where we have to identify the order parameter. So how we do that in the fermionic system, not like a wicked crystal, where you have molecules like a cigar pie, where you can orient and then you know, think about the position. We don't have a such an ingredient in the electron. <coughs> so instead of doing that, we can, on the other hand, we can still get some lesson from the wicked crystal, how one defines the pneumatic order parameter in the liquid. We can define such a similar like a quadruple <coughs> density, and you can see this order parameter here, which is taking a second derivative of the wave function. But look at that, this one is in 2D, I'm specifically writing in the two-dimensional case, that x derivative differs from the y derivative with a minus sign. If I have a plus here, that's nothing but a kinetic term. Okay? And uh, so q i is a, written in a, instead of writing in the matrix form, i is a refers to x and y, and we can write in you know, one form with i is a and y, and so that's referring to the electron momentum aligned or interaligned. So, consequence of pneumatic order, then, if we study from there, meaning that if I take the expectation of Q become finite, then when I begin with from the surface of circular like, then after I form the pneumatic order, that means that I'm going to deform the Fermi surface, and that's nothing but a deformation of the Fermi surface. So I break the rotation of symmetry because this is uh, all rotationally invariant, but now this rotational symmetry is preserved by one ABD. So this is nothing but a Fermi surface distortion. Then you can probably come up with uh, your back of study that, uh, well, we bought this in 1958, called by, uh, uh, called uh, Homolan something stability by Homolan something. So what it says is that the stability of Fermi liquid can be uh, studied, and you can write the energy of the whole system. As I change the density of the system, the Fermi liquid to be stable, then that stability condition meaning that this energy, which is a change due to the change of the density, has to be positive. Then the Fermi liquid will be stable, but if that's negative, then of course, the Fermi liquid is no longer stable, and there will be some instability. So, in this, you can see that this is a circular from the surface, in producing some perturbation, then you can expand this uh, 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 deformation around the pinot, and then expand you know, some uh, harmonic, um, you know, harmonic, uh, what they call the spherical harmonic function, and you can decompose into the different L channels, and at the end of the day, end up with the equation like that. And if this equation here, positive, that means formula is stable. If it's negative, then the Fermi surface is not stable, and then will continuously deform the Fermi surface. So that's called the convolution instability. So it seems like there's not much of a difference at this stage. Now let's look at the model Hamiltonian. So now you can construct the model Hamiltonian. 
um, just like a BCS, so write down the kinetic term here, and then think about the back system kinetic energy, and then write down some toy model where I take the trace of this uh, quadruple density matrix, and then uh, for some interactions, you can use uh, some show rate interactions and so on, and uh, then uh, if one worked it out, then what one can show is that the Landau Ginsburg energy through some in field theory, then Landau Ginsburg energy can be extended as this uh, trace of those uh, matrix of the sphere and then force. And cubitron is not allowed because uh, if you take the delta to the minus delta, it's a degenerate state, which is nothing but a rotating by 90 degree. So cubitron is not allowed. So you can see that, hey, if the all is negative, well, the B is positive, <coughs> then we will get into uh, the uh, second order phase transition. And that was done with cooking of the models and analysis of those was done by Garim back to 2001. And they were sort of claiming that this is a second order transition, there is a quantum critical point, quantum fluctuations will enhance some PC and so on. So on the other hand, let's think about this problem on a lattice because we are not dealing with the electron gas problem. If you put it on a lattice, scale lattice, let's think about some simple scale lattice, then this uh, other parameter is no longer written as kx squared minus kx squared, but it has to be cos and cos, like a tight binding model. And if you extend it to the small k, then we recover the continuum model, like a kx squared minus ky squared. In here or there, it doesn't really matter. Uh, and then you do the same thing like that. Okay, we cook up the some toy model, taking a trace of those, and then work on the mean field theory. And then what we get is that, in fact, as a function of the chemical potential, um, this problem is actually showing strong force of transition. And so it's so different from the continuum model where I take the small k limit, then it's not going to be supposed to show the second order transition, but on the other hand, in the sum scale high climbing model, then we do see a first strong, strongly first of the transition. <coughs> and the so, only, yeah. Sorry, is there a way to connect the, the toy model mm -hmm. to the theorem model? Yeah, I'm going to show that the, the, in the, when I come into the real material, then I'm going to show you some microscopic <coughs> theory to connect. I'm showing a toy model because it captures the main physics. Um, here, delta prime is this uh, diagonal component uh, of diagonal, and delta is the uh, diagonal component. And we do find that the uh, only this term is finite, and this term is actually zero, and that's due to the crystal field potential, I mean crystal potential. Um, so that's what we have found, and then we decide to analyze. Yeah. So presumably, if the chemical potential uh, is such that the Fermi surface near the center of the zone, like I'm still allowed to do the expansion, and I should have a good mapping to the continuum model. Yeah, you could have a good mapping, but then the phase shrinks as exponential. So this first uh, transition, ah, if you okay, go to the right. small k limit, then you'll find that this whole thing is just exponentially. Be, just because it's small. Yes. Okay. So it does have a continuum um, limit that you can recover, but if you are in a those uh, you know scale lattice, we know that the in fact that the, there is so called Ricci transition in a non-interacting system. So this transparency is trying to tell you why this has to be post the transition and it has a good connection to the well-known um, transition which is called Ricci. I don't know how many people are aware of it, but it's something that to think about. So Ricci transition is referring to the Fermi surface topology, and once Chagangman used as an example of the quantum order because it's a phase transition from the um, electron-like or hole-like uh, Fermi surface. When you go through here, then the free energy actually has some kind of similarity. So in two dimension, the free energy has a new scale of mu, and this because of the logarithmic, you can take the second order and then third order, second and half then you can find that the, um, the that derivative actually diverges and so on and that it was called the second and half in three dimensions it become a three and half and things like that because this power is actually changed as you change the dimensionality and this one you can work it out very simple uh, calculation so we decided to look at this and uh, for small mu and delta you can also calculate the free energy and then what do you find is basically this uh, analytic or non-analytic things are just shifted by the delta. 
And one can also calculate this when you have a CDW or SDW, and then in that case, the logarithmic singularity replaced by square root, and that gives you non-singular behavior. So it's very different from the fact that the, this one actually uh, remains as a metal, while the CDW and SDW give you the inch layer. So that gives you a difference uh, in the uh, free energy form, and uh, if you take the derivative, you can still see that there is a non-homogeneity. And that's just shifted by mu equal to plus minus two delta. But that's calculated with the toy model. I'm sorry? That's calculated with the toy model? Yeah, this one is also calculated in a toy model. Yes. Because, mm -hmm. because the Lifshi singularity yeah. doesn't break the so Yes, exactly. So that's why the Chagrin used as an example of the quantum order, because quantum order refers to the different phase, different phases of phase transition without invoking any broken symmetry. Because this one doesn't break any symmetry. But at this position, the free energies actually have non-analytic behavior. So if you take the compressibility or something, then your slope has to show some non-analytic behavior. Question? Yeah. If the, the singularity is not removed, doesn't it mean that some other um, uh, instability will take over? Well, that depends. So I'll show you that you can actually study the other orders and put them together, and you can actually show that uh, the, uh, they can coexist and so on. So I'll tell you why that's the case. So I'll probably come with that a little bit later. I just want to show that the why that has the opposite of transition. You know, you can go from here to there, and back here in the isotropic phase, that this delta is zero. As you go along here, you can see the three minimal occurs, and it becomes like a cube. So that tells us that the principle of free energy analysis is that all is not a negative, but also B is not a, not a positive. It has to be negative. And that means that free energy is not bounded. You have to have, you know, go to these high orders. And so you have to expect it to see a sixth order, and that leads to the post transition. And then the density of state is uh, also, because it's a metal, um, if you work on the tight binding model without the T-prime, say, um, next nearest neighbor, then you can show that density of state has this elliptic function behavior, which is basically logarithmic similarity at equal to zero. So going from here to there, we have to go through this uh, uh, Hoff singularity, and that's where, that in the middle point, where the delta is zero, then you go through this uh, diamond, and you can show that the density of state has to diverge logarithmically. But when the interaction is there, instead of taking um, this root, the system, because of interaction, takes one of this root. Remember, the delta positive is elongated along that direction. Negative meaning that elongate along the y direction. These are degenerate. System choose one of them spontaneously. Uh, so when that elongation occurs, the density of state initially has one of similarity at the forming surface, now <laughs> shifted by two pigs, separated by four delta. And now you can see the energy gain because instead of having here, the system is sitting there, and now pig is removed, so you we sort of gain the energy by doing so. Okay, and then finally temperature, this one here, is showing that the disposal of transition becomes a second order at the finite temperature, which is sort of expected, so I don't find that as a surprise. Okay, now in the presence of magnetic field, and this is where the connection to the actual material will come up, uh, and then I'll show you some microscopic theory with some bulky orbitals. Now let's put the magnetic field, and the, the magnetic field comes as a Zeeman chunk here. Um, you can add the orbital effect, but orbital effect in a metal is uh, when you have magnetic field is small, it's not particularly big, so I'm going to ignore it. So magnetic field, the Zeeman term is here, and then this one is a mean field, so I'm assuming that the delta, which is a cos k x minus cos k y, this guy, expectation of this to be finite. Then the h here is going to, looking at the mu here, mu and h, for the upspin, the chemical potential is basically shifted by mu plus h. On the other hand, for the downspin, the chemical potential is now mu minus h. So Zeeman term is nothing but the spin dependent chemical potential. So if you work it out in the presence of magnetic field, so instead of chemical potential, you fix the chemical potential. So we fix the chemical potential, now I'm changing the h. When I change the h, this h is spin dependent chemical potential. So when I change, the Fermi surface initially at h equals zero has the up and down same size. When I increase the h, 
the upcoming surface will go through the bottom singularity. So I told you that the way you go through this uh, use field of mu type of the bottom of singularity, because of the interaction, the one of the Fermi surface which is getting close to change the Fermi surface topology from electron light to whole light want to distort because of interaction. So up Fermi surface will distort. On the other hand, down Fermi surface, the chemical potential is opposite. So down Fermi surface will shrink and that doesn't suffer through the final singularity. So because of that, the downstream will just continuously, um, continuously uh, decrease, and that's what happens in the middle. And as I further increase, then what happens is the Fermi surface, the up Fermi surface, will get bigger and bigger. And now I'm going far from the bottom singularity, so they don't suffer from this distortion. It goes back to the isotope. So this one here, here to electron line to whole light, you go through the bottom singularity, but only an up Fermi surface. And the up Fermi surface has to be distorted, while the down Fermi surface doesn't have to. And that leads to the um, delta for up spin is finite within the H here, while the down spin is basically at zero. Since it's a Gaussian transition by definition, um, the density has to jump where delta is finite, mm -hmm. but only an up spin. And then it has to jump again at the where it goes back from dematic to isotropic. On the other hand, for the downspin, which is not suffering through this uh, interaction effect, will just continuously decrease. And then if you take the difference between the two, n up minus n down, which is a magnetization, and that magnetization will have jumps here, and then jump here. <coughs> so what we have shown is that basically the, there is the density jump, and that gives the magnetization jump, and that means the pneumatic phase is basically bounded by two metamagnetic transitions. Yes, Peter. Why can't the upspin Fermi surface uh, stay anisotropic at the upper transition? This one here? Yeah. I see it has to hit the, no, no, it's a third panel. Here? Why couldn't that yeah. be uh, bro symmetry broken? That's uh, because, here, because the, uh, the pneumatic transition occurs only near the final of singularity. Mm -hmm. So you can think of Austin below here, H was small below, um, smaller magnetic field, I wish I had a pointer, uh, smaller magnetic field, and this is a high magnetic field, and then pneumatic occurs in the middle, where initially the final of singularity was there. And then because of interaction, this actually is lifted. So in other words, pneumatic hinders the lifted transition. They don't want to have lifted transition. So they make the one which is far from the uh, that the final singularity density of state. This one and that one is okay, but in the middle, that's uh, where the pneumatic is found. And that doesn't depend on the details. Like you can put the p prime, double prime, whatever, and wherever the non-interacting term has the lipschitz point, and that's where the pneumatic sets in. And the window and then strength depends on the interaction. So that's why the uh, mm -hmm. Higher magnetic field equals back to the isotope. So here. <coughs> so that's why there has to be two consecutive metamagnetic transitions. And pneumatic is in the middle. Okay. So now I'm moving to some experimental evidence of the pneumaticity. And this is the glutamate compound. I'm sure that the, even last week a lot of discussions may have happened, but I was not here. But 2 and 4 is the superconductor. It's not clear whether that's a P wave to me. Um, I believe it's a triplet though. But the, anyway, 3D material 113 is ferromagnetic with uh, pretty temperature 160. Um, N equal 2 violates <coughs> the one that seems to show interesting behavior of this metamagnetic transition. And this compound has been a prototype material to show the quantum critical behavior. So I'm going to connect to the quantum critical behavior later on, and how we think about the post transition and quantum critical point and so on. So here is the resistivity transport data with a residual part, with a, you know, the common things that experimentalists and would do, A, T to the alpha, and the alpha is shown here colors. Near here, the alpha is linear, up to a pretty high temperature, and then this one is showing the residual resistivity showing a peak here around some magnetic field, a equals equal substance to diverge. 
which was a very typical type of the quantum critical behavior. But when the sample becomes quite clean, then what happens is that this was the initial one. As you increase the sample quality, this is a residual resistivity, rho naught. So that shows that you see that how much it has gone down, like order of magnitude cleaner. Um, and instead of having this quantum critical behavior, they seem to show two um, sharp transitions. It seems like a two Boston transition is shown instead of one critical point. And uh, again, this is a residual, uh, residual resistivity as a function of temperature. A low temperature, you can clearly see this uh, two peaks. And then as uh, you increase the temperature, it looks back to the original disposal sample. So if you put them together, all of the phase transition, this is the like so magnetic friction. What do you call residual resistivity? I'm sorry? What do you call residual resistivity? They extract to the zero temperature. Doesn't mean that they are measuring at zero temperature, but extract to zero temperature. But it's measured at T. Yes, it measures at a lowest temperature they can go down. Yeah, true. Some, some order of can do it. And then extract to zero temperature. That they call it residual resistivity. And then uh, these are susceptibilities, the real and imagined part. We confirm that this has to be a post a transition, and these two lines are referring that this become a second world transition. So it looks like what I have shown you that this appears, and I'm claiming that this has to be a phase. Okay. And then what they have done further is that in the presence of in-plane magnetic field, I must comment this because this residual resistivity in the XX pairs and YY pairs and shows exactly the same behavior. But on the other hand, if it's a pneumatic, then x jets and y jets should have different transport. And, but on the other hand, they have seen it only in the in-plane magnetic field. In other words, instead of putting the magnetic field before, it was along the c-axis. This is along the c-axis. Now they tilt it. They tilt it along a some particular angle, has some um, finite in-plane component. Then one direction of the resistivity parallel to the uh, pair of the in-plane component and the perpendicular, in perpendicular in-plane component has a strong anisotropy in the longitudinal residual resistivity. So rho xx differs from rho yy, so that tells the anisotropy transport, which is strongly suggesting that has to be a rotational symmetry is broken. By the way, this material is tetragonal, so there is no orthorhombicity whatsoever at the lattice level. Uh, and this pneumatic is bounded by the magnetic transport. No, in plane magnetic field, yes, it does break there. It does like you know, a lot of letters. She actually stayed on. Because in the AP plane, this is the tetragonal. But then the pneumonia is the most true in the result. Huh? The pneumonia is the most true. I'm sorry, I don't. I mean, it's not right. You have to, you know, true in the result is not right. You must have to, you know, you put it in the field page. No, 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 no. German field doesn't depend on the direction of the magnetic field. Yeah, so I have put the only a German one. On the other hand, you are right. If I have the magnetic field and I tilted it, then x direction differs from y direction. So in some sense, in plane magnetic field automatically selected one of them. So that requires some domains and things like that. So I'm not going to discuss that. But if you're interested in it, I can talk to you more about it. But I'm going to skip that part. Instead, I want to bring back to you that remember that I told you that this has some kind of quantum criticality and it has some post of transition. When are we supposed to finish by now? Uh, <coughs> oh, okay. Oh. Okay, so remember that I told you about the quantum criticality and even the system is ultra clean at a finite temperature that you know, this critical behavior is still there, remain, like a residual T3, this alpha, instead of from a liquid T sphere, you've got a 1 here, 1.5, and this is where the forming liquid looks like. And not only the resistivity, which is the this one here, um, and this is even field, this is about the 7.9 Tesla, that's the where the uh, resistivity is linear up to some temperature. And then uh, this one is a specific C over T, it's also having uh, some diverging behavior. Only at low temperature, that divergence is sort of uh, hindered by something else. Um, they also look at the C over T as a different uh, magnetic field. And you can see that there's a little hunt here and so on. <coughs> that there's one approach from the small field, which is zero Tesla, somewhere here, the seems like the C over T is also diverging.
diversing, as you get away from it, then this divergence is also wiped out. Okay? And this little thing here is I'm sort of um, exaggerating. It's way smaller than this because the one that just appears around one Kelvin, well, this one is five Kelvin. I just want to put there that, that there is a little bit of pneumatic and outside, seems like all unconscriptable things happen. So what happened? Because it's a post-hoc transition, how we can have all this critical fluctuation that you seen it at finite temperature. So this has been a big uh, question in the community, and uh, I don't think it has been reserved yet. So here's my proposal. Go back to the now microscopic theory. Uh, so far, I've been showing you all these toy models. Now you have to put the reality in the problem. How do we do this? Uh, the first point I always begin with is atomic configuration and then crystal structure, basically a space group. In this problem, it's very simple. It's a corombe, uh, not the corombe, it's a um, the, the perovskite. Forget about all of those things. What's important is that easy and if you just split it, that's it. The other splitting, forget it because the coping is big enough that that's irrelevant. So what's important here is that ruthenium has four electrons, filling the T2Z mostly. Um, and there is a spinobic coupling, which you cannot ignore. And I'll tell you why you cannot ignore later on. And there's a unicell doubling. And the unicell doubling is quite important, that coming from the fact that this perovskite, uh, ruthenium, just like a cuprate, ruthenium is inside this uh, cage of octahedra, and this octahedra is rotated um, stable in a way, not tilted though, rotated in a stable way. So when one building up, first thing is that we have to build up the kinetic energy, and then we'll add the interaction. In the kinetic energy, T2C orbital has to be all there, Y, Z, X, Z, X, Y. And spinomic coupling is there, so the basis we have chosen is up, up, down, because that acts like the result one, so it's better to use it this way. And then Q is pi pi to reflect the unicell doubling of uh, this cage. Um, we put some constant, but this one's supposed to be momentum dependent, and there's nice work done by Mark Fisher that has shown that there is some momentum dependence has to be there, but for our purpose, it's not that uh, it doesn't make much difference, so I'm going to just put it in a constant potential between the K and K plus Q, and then you have to put the time reversal. That's it. So it's basically just by this problem, because some of those uh, reasonable parameters, then what we find is that single layer case, this is sort of well known, and there's uh, um, many papers on this, by layer case, I'm just showing you here, this is the um, pop, oh, pop view, so showing the, how this octahedra is sort of staggering in our plane, and because of that, you can think of having this Fermi surface coming from here, <coughs> and uh, just the fold it, along this new zone boundary because you need to something you know half in the Fermi surface in the momentum space. Um, and this one here, separation is due to the spin orbit coupling because you can see this uh, bend here and uh, this one is a gamma, which is mostly coming from XY. So that's a gamma bend here, supposed to be like that. And then if you in not here, gamma bend is from mostly on XY. This one is mostly coming from one of, let's say, along that direction, it's an XC, so XC band, and because of spin orbit coupling up and down, it's mixed, and because of that, this splitting is occurs. If not, then the degeneracy is protected, because there's no way that you can mix with X, Y, and XC in this particular space group, in the PZ equals zero state. Yeah? Question, what's too fast for me? So, where does this unit of doubling come from? So, you have some charge order, or? No, this doubling is coming from the fact the oceans, here the ocean is not in the middle. Okay? So your okay. unit cell is going to be here. Okay. Is the, yeah, so that's basically this is going to be your unit cell. Okay. okay. So what for this one? That, for that, we're going to be the speed of the speed coming and what's the role of the range of space? Yes. I mean, it's not, it's not really what's the space, it's really something. Yeah, true. So it has to be here. But because of the informal small pocket, otherwise it's going to be this and you'll see a big things, which is like a, like a, like a back to, uh, yeah, yeah, yes, that's right. But even without it, I mean, I mean, some, a lot of people seems like confused about the spinor coupling. I mean, if the spinor coupling is a small cultivation, yes, that's right, because it comes as a first order, first order cultivation, so when they meet, that's the biggest effect. But even they don't meet, if the spinor coupling is big, that tended to 
uh, can be conflict then because atomic spin orbit coupling is a local interaction. SI dot LI dot LI. So because of that, it tended to uh, flatten the band, and a lot of people use it as a correlation effect. But they have to know that the band effect with the spin orbit coupling can also make the band mass heavy. So one has to always be careful, saying that always, oh, I got a flat band, mass is big, it has to be correlation. That's not the case when you have a spin orbit coupling, even they don't meet. Sorry, follow up to the first question. Is this the orthorhombic distortion which accompanies the pneumatic transition? No, it's not. Actually, um, so this is this uh, size here, and here is identical. So it's so still it's, tetragonal? Yeah, it's still tetragonal. Okay. You just double the units. So we come back to that later? Yeah, we yeah. can come okay. back to it the later. They've done the neutron deflection, just make sure that the length is uh, the same under the field and so on. They do have a volume change. A and B increase sure. all the simple signs. Mm -hmm. So there's a sum. Yeah, I just want to show you the office data to show that they can actually map to the uh, some type binding order by Mr. Reference or office uh, um, GX channel. Um, so, okay, so there you can see this little pocket, and I think that you can estimate how much spin of the from this separation. Um, so you can see all of those things and uh, um, some of those sensitive states. But what's important for the pneumaticity, remember that the, this is related to the form of singularity. And in a weak coupling, that's in some sense trivial statement because I have a lot of density of state at a certain, um, for me, surface right here, here by the formula. But I have so many electrons in that state. So even small interaction would be become so efficient to do some type of, you know, to form a some type of, some type, some, some kind of uh, Fermi surface instability. So it's important that, that you recognize that gamma two, which is this little pocket, gamma one, which is nearby this one here, is mostly coming from these edges, has the strong uh, logarithmic fan motion variety. So this problem actually gonna, you know, the toy model that we have learned is basically can also apply here. It's just that it has a little bit of more uh, sophisticated or more realistic band structure and orbitals involved. Okay, so now that's the kinetic part, the microscopic interaction. It's a metal. So I'm going to include the intraorbital in above, intraorbital, and then up to the nearest neighbors. You can add in more. I don't think it changes the physics much, um, the quality of physics. And then now I have to define, I have to define two of the parameter. One is index y. The fact that x, y has more bond along the x, y plane, I put the, this one in, mostly x, y. And then I have also used orbital right here. This uh, idea was first, uh, this was mainly what we have worked on. This idea was done by other people. And I just combined the two ideas to unify the theory. Um, so here's the orbital operating between the xc and yz orbital. So basically density difference. xc orbitals are more than yz orbitals, say, and it's a uniform. Um, this is an united orbital index y orbitals. Put it back here, then uh, we'll get the infield Hamiltonian, and all of this effective interaction will now, it's a sum function of original interaction, and that's written here. So you can see that this thing is important for the pneumatic. For the orbital ordering, the inter-orbital interaction is important. This one is also kind of trivial, in fact. You can write in terms of uh, this whole thing, this whole thing here, nxc plus ni, ni is square, minus nxc minus ny is square. So the relative density difference comes as attractive interaction. Just like uh, SDW from the Hubble. Now look at the, this one just changing us some um, spin orbit coupling and see what happens. So we've set the lambda equals zero. We do see this uh, cross-line transition. And because of spin orbit coupling, when the pneumatic, which is index y orbital, is finite, delta O, which I'm not showing here, but delta O is always non-zero because it's induced. Like a superconductor with a multi-gas, small gas can be induced due to the active band, you know, you know the major one. Uh, similarly here, delta O can be non-zero, and it is non-zero from here to here, exactly the same uh, phase space. This is a chemical potential, by the way. And then as you increase the spin orbit coupling, something interesting thing happens, and that is, let's uh, say here, you see that this becomes second order transition, and then this second order transition is followed
followed by the jump, which I probably meant as pneumatic. In other words, pneumatic is already broken, but it has a sudden jump, just like a metamagnetic. Pneumatic pneumatic state is actually has some certain increase. And that happens also at a different lambda, like here, and then it happens six down here. And as you further increase, then that disappears, and then we go back to coastal No, it's not the two different phases at all. That's why I say it's called the pneumatic, like a magnetic transmission. You know, you apply the magnetic field and look at the magnetization. Magnetic field breaks the SG2 spin rotation, spin symmetry. And then when magnetization occurs and it jumps as a function of magnetic field, instead of calling paramagnet, you call it metamagnet. Which doesn't break the, you know, it's not a spontaneous symmetry motion. So I'm saying, similar to the metamagnetic, here, the pneumatic state spontaneously is broken here, it's a second order transmission, but it jumps in here, it's like a metam pneumatic, where the pneumatic state is already broken, but it jumps. Okay, so just for the lambda equal point uh, one four, just want to you know show a little details, and you might be interested in what happens to the Fermi surface. In a coin model, we had only one single band and the whole thing deformed. Here, in fact, what really happens is near the gamma, which is sort of expected because that's where the final similarities are, gamma two and gamma one. And something happens here, but it's tiny you know, because the order of here is very small compared to that. Um, and so this red is inside the pneumatic. So you can see the elongation. I'm showing a half of the green one, so by the way, you can just reflect this in the other button. And so these three are the pneumatic, and these two are outside the pneumatic, showing that these are isotopic. Okay. This one is the low field where the hardness has gone, or zero field where the hardness shows the, show the form surface. So it's the toy model to sort of capture the main physics, except that point model only had one of the parameter and missed the quantum critical point. But if you put the multi-orbital with the spin orbit coupling, that the two of the interplay between the two, in fact, generate a more interesting phase diagram. So again, things will end up because uh, when you've done this, things will end up is always uh, one of the best to understand, but better to be last rather than the first. Um, study. So one study, and then we look at the things well and now, and this is the term that allowed by the spinovic coupling, and you go defend it. Of course, when you have this one, that doesn't mean that you have second order transition because if you work it out, the details, you'll find that it becomes a second order transition when this delta is sufficiently big enough compared to the compared to those coefficients, product of this. But at least we understand why this two order parameter interplay leads to the second order condition as well as this uh, thick meta pneumatic transition. So I think that this is my second last, I guess. So this is our full phase diagram. Temperature. The culture is also interesting. Here is the meta pneumatic transition. And this is the quantum critical point. Uh, where the second order transition occurs. In other words, this is just the three dimensional map of the pneumatic and then orbital ring. This is xy orbital, this was xcyz, density difference in xcyz orbital. And there's a jump here which corresponds here, and then critical point, which is here. So, what I'm trying to convince you is that the finite temperature where all this uh, critical fluctuation behaviors are uh, mostly governed by the critical point. On the other hand, as you go to the uh, low temperature, this one here, where the magnetic jumps, is actually governing the metamagnetic transition. So we miss it. If you just look at the metamagnetic transition, it's most likely we are going to simply miss that. Just want to compare with the uh, meta here, the again back to the experimental data of the uh, magnetic resistive um, transport data. You can see here is that here's the metamagnetic transition. On the other hand, there is another point where this anisotropy is hard to remove, which I you know, confirmed 
with the McKinsey's group, and they say that they were trying to remove this anisotropy, but it's almost impossible to remove it. So what I think is the quantum critical point is basically here, which governs the finite temperature behavior. On the other hand, metalliganticity is governing the metalliganticity transition at all. So, uh, yeah. so that's the sort of main. The summary is that multi-orbital uh, other parameters coupled to the other spin orbit couplings leads to the interesting phase diagram, you know, recovering both the second order transition and the meta magnetic transition, which is showing as a meta magnetic in the real material. So these are coming from interplay between all these interactions, final similarity, and spin orbit couplings. There are many open questions, I think, and one of them is other competition. There was a question, the competition to other states, some of them we have already studied. We have studied a competition with pneumatic and superconductivities, and they can coexist and gives us some interesting, you know, the phase boundaries and so on. We never published it though, but um, anyway. Um, and then the other ones like a ferromagnet, antiferromagnet. I think this is a very interesting question. Like, if you look at these materials, the difference is very minor. Like, uh, as I told you, this is a single layer, that's bilayer, this is a three-dimensional layer with all perovskite. The ground state, which is a true phase, one of them is superconductor, the other one is ferromagnet. In the middle, it's like a ferromagnetic fluctuation without any order. Um, and then if you substitute strontium to the calcium, this one doesn't have that, uh, the uh, unicell doubling, because it's a perfect tetragonal. This one has that uh, unicell doubling, the octahedra cage is again rotated, staggered way. And the reason for that strontium and calcium is different size of atoms. And the, so this one cannot occupy it without the rotation. So there is a difference in the lattice, which probably plays some role, but we don't quite understand the, why this uh, sister compound has very different ground state. Although it's easy to think about you know, how they coexist and how they can be, those things can be done in you know, some twin models. But I think I really like to suggest to especially students to think about some of these problems in a real material, in a small, small, minor, minor changes there seems to have drastically different ground state. So with that, I'll end my talk. Thank you. Are there any questions? Yes. Yeah, so you got the quantum critical point by introducing spin orbit coupling because that makes the x, y, and x, z, y, z orbitals. Right. Right? So another thing that could mix these is just c axis hopping because that's, that's odd under Z. Mm -hmm. And so have you thought about the possibility of having C axis hopping also drive your quantum critical point? I mean, how robust is it that it has to be spin orbit coupling? Could it be something else? C axis hopping actually depends on the momentum, as you know well. Mm -hmm. Because uh, X, Z, Y, Z, without having a tilting of the planes, the, you can actually mix with X, Z, but right off. You have to mix it that way. And that will give you some hoping which comes as a sine kz, sine kx, which will mix the xc and xy all the time. Yes, so it does mix it, but in a certain momentum which appears at a pi by 2 and pi by 2 is the maximum. It does have a weaker effect. We have done it, in fact. We have looked at the bilayer, put them together, and you really need a strong interaction. To make it, once you put a, such a strong interaction, the Fermi surface distortion is huge, and that much of Fermi surface distortion has not been seen by quantum oscillation. So we have just dismissed it. But yes, in principle, that's true. In this bilayer, what's the ratio between different types of orbits? Uh, in phase in bilayer, within bilayer, within layers in bilayer? Yeah, so layer by layer uh, is about the same as the, um, yeah, so. But in principle, this uh, order branch that you introduced to me uh, be different from this. Yeah, yeah. So the difference between this layer constant and then AB plane A is not very much. <coughs> it's about similar. So that's what Daniel is asking. In your patient, they are in phase all the time. So, yeah. They could be in phase and out of phase depending on T top. It's actually quite an interesting problem. It depends on the, um, the perpendicular hoping. Uh, as a function of chemical potential, we've done these studies as well, and you can actually find in phase, in phase meaning the pneumatic elongated x direction. The other one is elongated the same direction, so total is anisotropic, but you can also see out of phase, which is x direction distortion and y direction distortion, and total is isotropic. So that one has been seen it as well, but that also depends on the phase phase. 
But yes, bilayer, it can be taken into account and it's done it and doesn't really show much. But its main features remain the same. Yeah. I have actually another question. So your quantum critical point lies at the high field boundary. Right. And then you have a first order transition at lower field. So yes. is it clear that you can see quantum critical behavior below that lower field first order boundary? Do I see what? So does yeah. is it, it's not obvious to me that the quantum critical behavior would exact, would be, so where, where do you see the quantum critical behavior? Only inside this region? No, here. Here is the other component. No, but experimentally, is it seen? No, experimentally, no, experimentally, um, Experimentally has not been reserved. Okay? Oh. It's on my proposal. Okay? I'm a little bit ahead, I guess. <laughs> this may not be a good thing. But um, experimentally, they've seen only a two first transition. And this has been confirmed by many, many different methods. And I think the community sort of accepted it. Now, what happened, this is very low temperature, 100 millicalories. <coughs> this is temperature, what they see is that this whole thing disappears. They see all this, you know, all looking like a very nice quantum critical point. So the question was, okay, is that the critical point hinders beneath the pneumatic? So that was a sort of the current wisdom. People have been all believed that okay, <coughs> the pneumatic must be here, and that's governing whole finite temperature. But as you lower the temperature, this pneumaticity uh, comes in, and then whatever this quantum critical point, which may not be, and I have no idea what that is, um, but that, uh, that might be just uh, hindered by the matter. So that has been sort of the, um, people have been trying to explain the quantum critical fluctuating type of behavior just to, just to, mm, so, I don't want to, I, okay, politically correct statement is that the, um, they try hard to find the quantum critical point, and I say that I don't think it's in the underneath it, I think it's this point which is governing the point. So experimentally, it has not been settled at all. Even theoretically, I don't think it's settled at all. It's my first time presenting this, by the way. <laughs> we put it in an archive just a few weeks ago. Are there any more comments, questions? I have a question. You have been showing mostly uh, experiments with this resistivity as a function of magnetic field. What other kind of measurements have been done oh, yeah. in order to yeah. uh, probe these uh, pneumatic phases? Yeah, so the, in fact that because of time, I have um, deleted a lot of things here. Um, and there were some questions about that. So here, um, the measurement has been done. This is um, the sort of uh, all sets. Susceptibility has been done. The real part, the mass part. There's interesting data at the low field, which I don't think people know where we know. So here is the uh, imagined part of susceptibility, and this is the real part of susceptibility, with uh, some small AC frequency that they use. And then magnetic restriction, basically how the, that is constant change as a function of magnetic field. Um, Peter was asking some question. I said that the C-axis actually shrinks. So there's uh, something happening at, the, at this uh, position here. Um, and then there has been a specific thermodynamic measurement as well. So it's, not, it's actually a lot of data that says collapsing. And I'm putting all things that together. I put it here. That's the as Daniel was asking. The critical point people have been put So far. There is an answer. Sorry, I'm too small to see. Um, th there's also a sort of strand of arguments which has oh, yes. emerged in favor of trying to get. Um, uh, sort of weekly incommensurate magnetic phases. Yes, FFLO. So sort of, if you like FFLO type stuff, mm -hmm. again by looking at you know the instability of a first order quantum critical point. So you know, what's your, do you have a comment on that? On how would you distinguish that from the various pneumatic phases? And you know, what's the overall story? Yeah, yeah. So in fact, that's kind of. <laughs> You know, kind of, kind of, kind of uh, happens that I was just having uh, some email exchange with Andy, Andrew Green, who is the one who has proposed another scenario for this phase. So there are two theories, okay? So, you know, when you invite the speaker, they only talk about their own theory, given the time constraint, I guess. But because my formal voice is asking, I have to. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't trying to put you on no, the spot. That's a joke, you know that. <laughs> um, so here, uh, there are two proposers, theoretical proposers, if I'm, as far as I can, within my knowledge. Uh, that's one is the and then that has a lot of pretensions. But another one is the kind of 
about um, in commensurate spiral type of order with a finite weight energy. It has a very good uh, experimental uh, background because uh, there's a neutron stacking which shows us some kind of peak at a some incommensurate wave vector, which is basically connecting the, remember gamma two pockets that I was showing you, that the little pockets, and if you connect that two pockets, there's a density of state, so the susceptibility will have a huge effect with that wave vector. So that has been studied, but what they say is that the experimentalist has moved out of that possibility a little bit. I don't think they completely ruled out, because they look at the neutron scattering as a functional field, and they were expecting if the spiral order sets in, that peak has to become static. And I don't think that has been seen. On the other hand, of course, you cannot rule out the possibility of dynamic spiral, but then it becomes unclear how you can distinguish dynamic spiral from the pneumatic, because that's again breaks the rotation of symmetry. Once it from dynamic, there's no translation of symmetry associated with it. But the rotational symmetry. Is, I mean, is there a, sort of a way of um, bringing these points of view together? Because at some level, both of them look at something which begins out as a first order transition and you know, produces, you know, first order transitions don't like to happen, and they can often be replaced by more complex structures. One is the pneumatic, the other is the yes. magnetic. And mm -hmm. um, they have to be related somehow. Yes, I, I totally agree. In fact, that the, what I was initially thinking that uh, another way of thinking, yes, um, the spiral order, if you put a little bit more quantum fluctuations, the way, it most likely it's going to get the pneumatic. That's what I'm thinking, in fact. And Andrew and I are going to discuss at the Cambridge, in fact. So we are going to put them together and see if we can make uh, more progress in this community. So, Peter, you have a question? Yeah, I also forgot to add one thing to my announcement about the survey earlier. Please put it in a box which is outside the uh, office of the institutes, sort of off of the main uh, lobby that you walk through to get to lunch. Okay, so you're, you're going to be going there anyway. Just put it in the box. And um, the question actually is, I'm, this is probably naive and maybe I missed something, but many of the nice features of your theory come from combining two pneumatic order parameters. And the one I kind of think I understand, it's this orbital ordering term, which many people have looked at. Mm -hmm. uh, the other one, I don't really have a good sense of what it means in real space. Can you explain that a little bit more? The, yeah, the uh, delta n? That, you know what, you're not the only one that doesn't have sense. I don't have sense of that either. And the reason for it is because the, uh, I plot these pictures at the end. Um, remember the orbital ordering is simple because it's a uh, local. Yeah. It's just uh, I side. And um, that gives us the just the density difference. I put it here. Um, I mean, I'm not sure when you can see this, but this one here is supposed to be a y. And actually, you can see the low is difference. So you can see the density. If you square this, it's going to be density. Um, and uh, y is equal because it has the more density than x here. So it's a local yeah. feature, so which is easy to understand. On the other hand, xy is not because the order parameter comes with the force case minus, but it's a momentum. So I don't want to put the low side elongated or anything like that because it's not a local picture. Um, so on the other hand, mathematically it's quite easy to see. Physically, yeah, it's a, some kind of hoping um, figure Px differs from Py, which comes from the V and I and J term. And you can probably recognize it better than I do because if you do V and I and J do a momentum square transform, then you can see that that comes as post K X plus post K Y total squared minus cos kx minus cos ky total square. Just like the ni of and i down type of thing. Mm -hmm. So the relative difference between kx and ky is the one that kept our track of channel. So it's coming from v, ni, and j. Try to, just like you know, intra of an interaction, try to reduce the Coulomb interaction, reverse interaction <laughs> in that slide. OK, so if that's the answer, then maybe I'll ask a brief follow-up question. Uh, at the risk of keeping people from lunch. Um, there, there is now, as I understand it, an observation of an orthorhombic transition associated with the, the pneumatic uh, state mm -hmm. in x-rays. Very, very, very tiny, yes. but it's there. Yeah. And so which of your two order parameters couples to the lattice uh, better, or is that some combination? Well, Have you the, thought about yes. that at all? Yes, I did. Um, so, um, the, there is another, so let me, because I, to answer your question, probably just for the sake of 
sake of other audience. But there was another experiment done X-ray is under the magnetic field to see if there is any lattice dispersion between X and Y. So I told you neutron diffraction has not been seen it, but you sort of, we expect sort of those because, um, because it will be induced. Because once you have a pneumatic, which will have the anisotropy between X and Y, and that will, because it's a T2 type of the other parameter, it will couple to the lattice, and the lattice will be distorted uh, due to the pneumatic. So we are sure. thinking that the pneumatic is the origin of the lattice distortion. Sure. That has been seen and by Okay. The experimental group in UK as well. Um, and uh, that difference is very, very tiny. They have interpreted that with the orbital order because, again, because of the local mm -hmm. you know, feature, it's easy to interpret that. Way. And there was a theory of this and so on by the um, Lee and you know, other people. So that's where they can fit it and so on. But, but I think that the, even the XY is equally going to couple to that because it's an IZ, which is just fundamentally equal. And uh, the one that I show you that I have used the leading instability as the XY orbital, but we don't have to do that because the XC minus Y orbital ring is equally good too. The reason that I have chosen one over the other as a leading instability is again going back to the Fermi surface topology change. If I have putting all this by way of being more realistic, put everything that you can think of, what happened is that if you make the living instability coming from orbital ordering, the Fermi surface, because it's coming from XCY is one D, once you have the pneumatic, the Fermi surface will become open, widely open. So as a living instability, that is a huge change in the Fermi surface topology. Uh, so that's why I put the orbital ordering as a uh, induced ordering. But in principle, in theory, so that's based on the, you know, use the guide principle from the experimental data rather than theoretical selection. So we have two last questions, one in the back and uh, one from the uh, back. So this is a quick question. There are some HTML data available and some HTML maps for these <coughs> materials. Did they see any, any incommensal vector or any structural reconstruction? Can you repeat your question again? Yeah, there are some HTML data available on this material from Seven Service Group. Yes. Did you just see any of these Q, uh, Q vectors? No, HTML data so far published to see the orbital. X, Z, and Y, Z orbital. Maybe Mark can comment this better, but I know that the published one they have sent that, okay, we've seen an X, Z, and Y, Z orbital in the SDM, but that's not surprising at all because that's sort of expected X, Z, Y, Z again, and it's nested. So, it's the best to see it. I don't think it, it'll be very difficult to find the gamma 2, that small pocket in SDM, because it's so little. You see that when they do this uh, mapping to the momentum space, yeah. they have to do the free transforms, and they basically have to massage the data. <laughs> Not to massage, <laughs> analyze the data. <laughs> <laughs> We've filled, uh, uh, no, not yet. They are planning to do it. So what I'm saying is that in the absence of field, they've done it and they've seen it as two of those. Very short question, actually. Did I get it right with the, uh, yeah, yeah. if you don't pick up, it becomes too strong, then your feet is gone, yeah? Uh, yes, at the end it goes, it goes away, because it shrinks and shrinks and then it's gone. Yes. So it may mean there is nematicity in the so I think it's uh, time now for lunch.